television. It's supposed to be bad weather down here in a couple hours. Bob Nedelicki in Austin, Texas, right? Yep. Yes. Uh, uh, welcome to Keeping the Nostalgia Live. We have uh, Indiana Pacer icon and legend Bob Nedelicki with us, or Neto as uh, his nickname is. And uh, we're going to chat a little bit today about uh, the passing of uh, Bobby Slick Leonard, uh, another icon, icon when you think about basketball and the state of Indiana. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, the Keeping the Nostalgia Live show. And you're also probably maybe listening to this on our audio podcast, which is at Keeping the Nostalgia Live, all one word, dot podbean dot com. And Neto, thank you for joining us. I know you've probably been on the phone uh, the past couple of days like crazy talking about Slick. Yeah, I've had a lot of people, a lot of radio people called me, a lot of sports people called me. At the, I'm noticing like your background of where you're at, you got that Hoosiers poster back there. You're missing one thing back there. You don't what? have that red blue ball. You better get a hold of Atlanta Sports and taught, get, uh, get Scott Tarter to send you ABA ball. Now, but normally I have this in the background, but I couldn't, I couldn't have it. I couldn't have it in my hands and in the background at the same time. So I do have a kind of a red, white, and blue ball there, but I do need one of those. You're correct. And this book is called We Changed the Game. It is a fantastic read, uh, a, a great a book to just slap on your uh, uh, living room table. And it's a, uh, uh, a conversation piece. You can get it at Amazon.com and at, I think HiltonPublishing.com. Right. Yeah, but uh, just a just a fabulous read. Of course, of course, mine is autographed. So so don't be jealous oh, right. of people out there. But it's it, it's one of those. It's a binge read. So you can probably read it and, you know, in a couple of days, but it's very informative. Great photos that you've never seen in there before. And just great stuff about the uh, beginning of the Indiana Patriots. Like, like, like Slick would call it, it's a one six pack read, I think. <laughs> but, you know, if, if people want to know the thing about Bobby Leonard, we tell the real stories in there, not a lot of the secondhand stuff that's out there that nobody really knows the real stories. And the real stories are much better than the, the fiction. Neto, what kind of relationship did you have with uh, Coach Leonard uh, post, post playing basketball for him? Well, you know, it, it kind of has to relate to when I first met him, even pre-basketball. Uh, Slick handled the, uh, the, the camp, the first time the Pacers were formed in 67, he handled the free agent rookie uh, uh, tryout camp. And uh, I got to know him then. And then the, he lived in Kokomo, Indiana, where Jimmy Rail lived. And Jimmy was friends with Slick. And uh, I was really good friends with Jimmy. So I'd go up there and the Slick and me and Jimmy would go out and have us a couple of, uh, couple of beers and talk a lot. And, and I got to know Slick and he, I, I started seeing what a, he was, he was really, you know, I really liked his style. I really liked what he'd say about the team. And then that summer of 68 or 69, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, we were out a few times and he kept telling us, he said, you know, you guys got great talent. He just said, you're just not, you're not playing right. It's like, uh, you know, he always said, Slick always said, you got to have the horse to win the race. You got to have the horses, but the, the old saying too, you got to have a jockey that knows which way to point them. And, uh, and the uh, slick was that guy. And then of course uh, we got Mel Daniels that year and, uh, and uh, slick was hired after about two weeks into the season. And, uh, and literally that changed the whole deal. He came in, uh, he changed our whole outlook. We were a really good team. We had four great, four very good players averaging 20, but we just, we didn't know what we were doing. We weren't playing together. There was some chemistry and slick brought us together, not only as a team, but as a family, that's the first thing he told us when he came to camp. He said, this is a family. There's no color line here. There's none of that crap. And he used a few more colorful words than that, of course. But uh, he, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he laid it on us pretty thick. And he said, well, you know, we're all, this is going to be a family. We're all going to live together, die together, win together, lose together. And if you don't like it, you can leave. And uh, we all kind of looked at each other. And, uh, and I think the results in the following uh, four or five years, uh, played that out of course that after after basketball you know i uh again we had a very unusual team uh we stuck together like this in a family for 20 30 40 years after 50 years <laughs> god i'm getting old 50 years after the uh after that was over we still all uh go out to dinner with each other we talk to each other uh you know a few of us have passed away mel passed away a few years back roger 
but uh, at least once a month we would meet uh, up in Carmel and uh, go to lunch together and George McGinnis and uh, Darnell Hillman, Billy Keller, all of us together. So it was a, it was something that I don't think you see in sports today. And I don't think you will see in sports uh, ever again. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, a friend, it sounds like first coach second, what, what was it like when, I mean, was it still like a family situation with you and coach Leonard when, when he would have to cut somebody trade somebody i mean what you, you know and, but you still had that relationship oh it was a tough deal you know when he traded some people but uh, you know he did what was necessary uh he, i was traded down to dallas for a year and i know slick when he did it we had a long talk and he was he didn't want to do it but it was a strictly uh i think it was more monetary than anything else but it was one of those things and uh, of course a year later i after a few months in san antonio i came back to indiana but I think that the, the core of us stayed together for so long. And then, of course, when Mel Daniels, uh, they traded Mel Daniels, Roger Brown, and Freddie Lewis to Memphis, um, that was not a personal thing. That had nothing to do with talent. I'm sure all the newspapers said, well, they're getting old and they need to be traded. That, that's all crap. Uh, if you'll read in my book, the real reason, Dick Tinkham, of course, was the president. He tells the real reason. The real reason is the Pacers were broke. They didn't have any money. And Memphis gave uh, Mike Storms run in Memphis. Memphis gave the Pacers one hundred fifty thousand dollars for those for the players, which basically got the Pacers through that year. So it was strictly money, it isn't like it is today, where there's you know guys make a half a million dollars a game. It, it was a totally different world back then, and uh, it was kind of like you had to, if you had to stick together or you wouldn't make it. Tell us a little bit. You're a huge ad advocate. You know, Dr. J is on, on the board. Artist Gilmore is on the board. Tell us about droppingdimes.org and how much of a, 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 a little bit of an uphill battle it's been against the NBA to get basically what was promised to um, the uh, former ABA players. Well, see, I, I was a player rep for the team. And then the year the merger happened, I just, I just retired, but I was still involved. And one of the main, there was two main sticking points in the merger and the player association, the player push, the player association could have stopped the merger had the two Ted, the teams not agreed to two things. The one thing was that if any player had a no cut contract and didn't get picked up by an NBA team or didn't get picked up, they were to honor the, honor the contract. And the other thing was that they were to take all the eligible players. That's a guy that played three or three years plus. Uh, would be funded into the NBA pension program. Those are the two things, and the, the four teams agreed on it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, back then, there wasn't quite the computer age. There was paperwork was lost. Uh, they just did things different, and they just never fund. They never did anything, and we never called it on. We never knew what was going on, and it's just a shame. And, of course, you got 50 years ago, the statute of limitations kind of come in, and, and uh, in 1960, uh, gosh, I think 2000, uh, Towards the end of 2010 or whenever, I called to see about my pension. I was supposed to get my pension. And, of course, naturally, it's not there. And the old ABA pension was floating around. But they they tried to – that was, uh, you know, based on a, an NBA player today uh, played back when I played. If he waited and got his pension at 62, uh, if he played five years, he's, he's getting 10000 a month where the, the, the ABA guy said, well, no, we're going to give you what, what was back then was about uh, you know two hundred dollars a month so it's a little ridiculous and um, so i've been fighting this thing for about 10 11 years and uh slowly but surely uh things have happened uh the sad part about it we started out with about 200 guys we're down to about 100 now and uh and um we uh dropping dimes uh was formed by scott tarter back in about five six years ago and scott knew about our plight and he wanted to uh, form something. Him and John Abrams formed this deal. And uh, they help out players that maybe weren't even eligible for a, a pension. They help out uh, ABA players, but they've been also fighting for our pension rights. And uh, with the latest things going on right now is the NBA has finally come around to uh, looking at us. And they gave uh, pensions to the old timers back in the 40s. And what it would cost them, we're not asking for the big pension, just a small one, just to give us a little respect. And uh, they're actually working on it now. And what it would cost them would be about, I figure, what they pay for coffee creamer every day <laughs> at the front office. It's 
very minimal money uh, compared to what the, the, the NBA makes nowadays. But dropping dimes, uh, Scott has done a great job. The poor guy, he works, a, I'd say, 80 hours a day uh, on this, and plus uh, having a, a big-time law business. And uh, he has helped so many people. I think people have read about George Carter in USA Today, how he helped him. And, you know, here's an all-star ABA, NBA player that the uh, ABA player that uh, was entitled to a pension and was living in Las Vegas, had cancer, uh, had no money. It was being evicted from his home and things like that. And Scott and the boys came in and helped him and just stuff like that. Uh, you know, back then we didn't make that kind of money they're making today. <laughs> I think the highest paid player in the NBA was uh, Jerry West made about 35,000 back then. And we thought that was the end of the world. So it's a, it was a different, it was a different game back then. But uh, as you talked to me, uh, we had another player that uh, mentioned in the article, uh, Frank Card, who made a ar- uh, statement in the article, that they're waiting for us to die and frank passed away yesterday so we've had a couple a couple aba guys and frank was a, was a heck of a player and a great guy and uh we also know three or four other guys that are pretty sick right now but uh, uh we're working on it hopefully we're making some progress and uh and we owe a lot to scott tarter and dropping dimes and i'm just privileged to be on the advisory board and we got some great guys on it we got you know you mentioned dan we have dan Essel, we have uh peter vesey we have uh, bob costas and the uh, George Gervin, uh, a lot of guys like that, that, uh, you know, they, uh, they know where their roots are. And we're like, it's amazing. We're like one big fraternity, uh, the ABA. We're not, uh, we're not aloof. You call an ABA player and you mention ABA and he'll talk to you for 20 minutes. And, you know, you guys can go to droppingdimes.org and uh, read what that is all about and the plight. You can also donate at droppingdimes.org. You can also go, if I'm not mistaken, to lunasports.org. Com, I think it is, and Lama. there it, yeah, there's Lama, L-A-N-A, Lama Sorry. Sport. Okay, and LanaSport.com, and they have a fabulous ABA basketball card collection, and the, tell us about the red, white, and blue ball, and how that came about, the reproduction well, the, of it. The NBA supposedly had the, had the trademark for that uh, ABA ball, and I think they let it lapse, I'm not sure, but I know Scott got it, and uh, I know the ABA was crying about it a little bit, but too bad. Uh, but it, anyway, Scott has produced an a, absolute replica of the ABA ball. And the only thing on it that uh, might not be a little different is they use the commissioner's name is Slick Pinkham. And there's a great story behind Slick Pinkham. Slick Pinkham was the 10th player in the draft in 19, I believe, 74, five, and from DePauw. Now, of course, he never existed. But Bobby Leonard and Dick Tinkham were sitting around drafting people. And the draft went like 10 or 12 rounds and there was nobody to pick. And they were getting upset and probably had a couple toddies along the way. And they decided to draft this fictitious person who actually made it in the New York Times. They were drafted Slick Pinkham. So they start the first name was Slick after Bobby Leonard. And the last one was Pinkham after Dick Pink, Tinkham. And he, he went to DePauw. So that's where the story of the commissioner goes. But I've actually, I've got, I've got a couple of those balls. I know some people that got them. And uh, I had one friend of mine that uh, wanted to get one for his son. He bought one and I guess all his neighbors bought them. They must have bought a dozen of them. They couldn't believe how, how perfect they were, but nobody wants to play with them. They want to put them in a trophy case. So I think that's what you need right behind you there, right below that Hoosiers uh, <laughs> thing. That would be perfect. Okay, so I just made a spot. There we go. Right. There we go. I'll take I'll take Bobby. Uh oh. And then I could put uh, the ABA ball in there. I like that. I like- <laughs> and I have seen it also online. And guys, it is a great, great looking piece. And Neto is correct. You're not going to, you're going to want to put it up on a display. You're not going to want to put it, you're not, you're not going to go shoot it out on your, uh, your basketball hoop outside on your garage. Although, but it is a fabulous, can, fabulous piece. Although you could, it's a very nice ball. It's well made. Buy, buy two. Yeah, buy a couple. And, 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 the, and the proceeds go to dropping dimes. There's another thing that, uh, that's out there. I don't know if you've heard of the Bob and Tom show in Indianapolis. So it's all it's syndicated around the country. Uh, Tom was going to do a fundraiser for Dropping Dimes last spring. And what they were going to do, as you all know, I had a bar named Nettos for about uh, four years. And it got pretty, pretty wild. And they were going uh, downtown, a big bar downtown was going to shut shut up for one night and rename itself Nettos. 
and we were going to have a big pacer ABA people come in and all the proceeds were going to go to dropping dimes. But with this COVID thing, it's going to be put off for a year or so. But Bob and Tom has made some gorgeous hats and Neto's t-shirts and they, it's all on them. Tom did this. It's a, he's a great guy. And you can go to Bob and Tom's store uh, on the internet and every penny of this, uh, you can get a t-shirt or a hat, every penny, not every single penny goes to dropping dimes, which is really a great deal. And I saw, I've actually a friend of mine, uh, I met up in Indianapolis last August, uh, got the shirt off, off uh, online and uh, it is a fabulous looking shirt and you can get it in really big boy sizes too. I think I got a, I think I actually have a picture of slick wearing one. I'm not sure, but uh, you know, we, I would, you know, since I'm in Austin, I don't get back as much, but uh, you know, last time I was over at slick, every time we get, every time we go home, bingo, we would go, that's the first place we'd hit is slick's house. And, uh, and we'd uh, all go to lunch at this uh, place called Dooley's up in uh, Carmel. And uh, we would sit and probably tell the same stories and the same lies over and over again. But we had a we, we had a great time. And uh, that's actually a picture of us after lunch at, uh, at Dooley's. And it's Rob and George, myself and Slick. But, uh, you know, I can't say enough about uh, Bobby Leonard. He was, uh, you know, he, although he was only 10 years older than me, he was like he was like a second father to me. And uh, I'll tell you another story a lot of people don't realize in 1970, when my uh, my mother passed away in 1970 and uh, I flew home to be at the funeral and the morning of the funeral knock on the door. There he is. He flew in the Cedar Rapids and went to the funeral with me. And, uh, and, uh, we flew home. A friend of my dad's had a, had a plane and flew us back home for the game that night, but not a whole lot of coaches would do that. And he, uh, he was very, uh, you know, he was, I, I'll never, ever forget that. And, uh, I made a purpose. I made it a very, purpose when his when his dad passed away i went to i went to the funeral for his father and uh, you know like i said we had a we had a relationship that uh very very few athletes and uh, coaches have you know uh, in interviewing tommy john he did the same thing uh, when tommy john's mother passed away I mean, you know showed up for uh, uh her funeral but uh you know you know netto i i, I you know it's, it's been a uplifting and fun chatting with you but you know, you, you lost your best friend a few years ago in uh, uh, Big Mel and, and you know, and I know it, uh, uh, Slick was 88 and we know we all don't live forever, but, you know, it's, and I'm not trying to be a downer, but, you know, what were your kind of thoughts or how much do you miss Mel and, and what were your thoughts and uh, original thoughts on uh, when you heard that Slick had passed? Well, you know, Robin Miller called me uh, that morning and Robin never, he never gets up before noon. So he never calls me usually early. And I had this, I honest to God had this premonition. I went, Oh my gosh, I hope it didn't slick and bingo. It was, but uh, you know, slick lived 88 years. He, he did more in 88 years than most people do in 500. Um, he, what a life he had. And uh, people don't realize on the court, they saw Bobby Leonard on the court. And when he went on the court, he changed. He was Dr. Jekyll Hyde. I mean, he was ready to kill the other coach, the other players, the referees, everybody. But the second that game was over, you know, the, the common person would walk up to him on the street and five minutes later, they're best friends. I mean, that's the way he was. It's not like it is today. Some of these aloof athletes and coaches that, you know, you got to make an appointment to talk to him. It wasn't that way with slick slick was uh like I said, he was one of a kind and uh, he's going to be missed. I'm sure going to miss uh, going back and having that uh, those lunches every week and talking to him uh, on the phone and teasing each other about everything we can. Uh, I told them, and I really believe this, that uh, I talked to Nancy and I guess they're going to have some kind of little church service. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> with this COVID thing, Slick needs a proper send off. And I don't think any sign of one of these you know, funerals where you're 20 feet apart, wearing a mask would do slick honor. I think that, and here's my recommendation. So all you people out in Hoosier land, uh, I think they should put a statue of slick in front of Mark, in front of Banker's Life Fieldhouse. And when they make a big deal and unveil it, say in the fall, when everybody can go down and, and you know, pay tribute to him and then go inside and have a memorial, I think that'd be great. And if they do put a statue up, I'm going to go up there and put a hockey stick in his hand, too. <laughs> Give us a story about the hockey stick. 
Oh, wow. He, you know, he tells that story all the time. Well, we were up in Duluth. It was, it was Slick's first year or second year, and we were playing an exhibition game up in Duluth uh, with uh, Minnesota, and um, it was cold. We were using a hockey uh, hockey locker room, and uh, I must admit, and Slick said I dogged it the first half. I wasn't playing real well, and Slick came in, and he was so mad, and he started cussing at me, and he looked at me, and he looked over at this hockey stick rack. He grabbed a hockey stick and come toward me, and I ran in the bathroom and I locked myself in the bathroom stall and he broke that hockey stick on the bat, beat that hockey stick to death on the bathroom floor, uh, on the door, uh, saying a few four letter words to me, I should say. <laughs> but the story, the funny part is I think I got 25 in the second half. So, so that's one of the funny stories, but, uh, it, uh, like I said, the, uh, two minutes later, uh, you know, he'd be wanting to kill me and five seconds after the game, we're out having a drink and, arms around each other tell me just a little bit and tell everybody just a little bit how the book came about and um um uh, you know and you know just tell us a little bit of how it came about and, and getting it done well it is an interesting story because uh, you know the first book ever about the aba loose balls were written by terry pluto it was a great book great book but it didn't have a, some of the stories were a little exaggerated and things like that and and uh most of the books written are, you know, my mother heard that my cousin saw that uh, my uncle told me this. And uh, Dick Tinkham and I were sitting, we were very good friends. And Dick was the original Pacer owner. He was the, he was the president of the league. He was a league counsel. He was the head of the merger committee. He knows everything. And he, we were sitting and he just was laughing one time. And he said, yeah, I just read this story. And he said, he said, these people don't have no clue what happened. And I said, what do you mean? And we said, well, I'll tell you one story. And I said, what's that? He said, well, he said, in 1969, you guys were second year in the league. You guys were in the playoffs. And it was the first round. We were in the seventh game in Indianapolis. And we were playing the Kentucky Colonels. And the Colonels had a good team. And we were a 10-point underdog. And I said, okay. And he said, nobody, know, not the general manager, nobody knew this. The owners had a meeting that morning with bankruptcy attorneys. And had we had we lost, he said, had you guys lost that game, we were folding the team the next day. And I said, you got to be kidding me. And he said, oh, yeah. And I thought back, I said, well, no, wait. if he would folded the team, if we'd lost that game, he folded the team, the league would have folded. Everything would have been different. There probably wouldn't be a Colts. There probably would be, you know, it just, it, so I said, you got to be kidding me. And he said, oh, yeah. And he said, there's some other stories. And he started telling me these stories. And I said, God. And he said, we really should write a book, but how do we do it? We don't know how to write. So we started thinking of writers and uh, we thought, well, a couple guys, this guy, that guy. And then all of a sudden a light bulb went off in my head. I said, yeah, one of the best writers around is Robin Miller. And the key with Robin Miller was Robin Miller was our little cub reporter that started reporting on the team in 69. And I, when he came on board, he was an 18 year old. <laughs> he calls himself an 18 year old virgin that didn't know anything, but I, I, I dubbed his name Jimmy Olsen, cub reporter. So I called Robin up and Robin was really enthused. He said, oh yeah, I'd love to do it, I'd love to do it. So one thing led to another. And then a funny part was publishing a book is not easy. Uh, you know, it's, it's expensive. And if you go with a big company, if you get a big company to do it, they might give you, you know, they might sell a million books and give you $10, go buy a hamburger. You know, you're lucky to do that. And then John Abrams, a friend of his, named Hilton Hudson owns a he's a cardiovascular surgeon in Chicago and owns a big publishing company and they do a lot of medical books a lot of things like that but they also do books well it's as a when he was playing at North Lawrence North he was a basketball player when he was in high school and we used to let him practice with us up at Park Tudor and his greatest story was well, he used to say that he'd always, they'd always, the kids would always get mad because Roger would bring Marvin Gaye along. Marvin Gaye, the singer, thought he was a saint, thought he could play basketball. And we'd always make the kids take him on their team. And he couldn't play a lick, but, the, but we had a lot of fun. So Hilton called us and said, I want to publish the book. And he said, I'll take care. I'll do the publishing and we'll do a split. And he did a really good deal. And they did a beautiful, as you can see, they did a beautiful job on the book. It's not it's not some junky paperback book you want to throw away. It's a very, very nice, well done book. And, uh, and that's how we did it. And, uh, you know, we, we weren't in it to make a bunch of money. We were in it to just get the book out. And, uh, you know, uh, 
everybody that reads it loves it. It's just, uh, you know, PR in a book these days is pretty tough, but uh, I think, uh, I think people, there's so many stories, especially the merger stories. I mean, people don't know what happened. We have one chapter in there. I don't know if you remember the chapter, the name of the chapter is which one of you assholes is Tinkham? I hope I can say that. Okay. But that's the name of the chapter. And the reason the chapter's name is those were the first words spoken in the ABA NBA merger. The very first words. Dick walked into a meeting in New York and Ned Irish, who was president of the New York Knicks, stood up and said those words. And Tinkham said, well, that'd be me. And then one thing led to another. But there's so many stories in there that are fantastic. I mean, I didn't realize that... Uh, I didn't realize that um, um, who, who was the owner of Laker? Jerry Buss actually owned the Pacers. He bought the Pacers. And then he was at a party. Dick Tinker was trying to get somebody to buy the Pacers. And Dick got Jerry Buss to buy them. And he was at a party in L.A. And uh, I guess Jack Kent, he was bragging about the team. And Jack Kent Cook came up to him and said, God dang. He said, if I knew you had that kind of money, I'd sell you the damn Lakers. And he said, you're kidding so anyway, he went and got a friend of his to take the Pacers off his hands, and he bought the Lakers. And just crazy stories like that that nobody knows about. And uh, that's why I think the book is so interesting. Uh, yes, we changed the game, which can be found. We changed the game.com. Also, you can find some information at droppingdimes.org, and you can also go to hiltonpublishing.com. It is, uh, of course, uh, uh, Nettle was nice enough to send me an autographed copy, which is a copy, which is fantastic. And I'm telling you, you put it on a dining room or living room table. It's that kind of the paper is, you know, high quality. Um, it's not like your normal pa uh, paperback or regular book, but it's fantastic. Uh, well, Nettle, Nettle, what was that, what was your last conversation like with um, uh, Coach Leonard? Yeah, it was like Slick was telling me when we, we, we got the name for the uh, for the uh, book, we changed the game. He, he looked at us and said, you got that right, baby. And I mean, you really, you guys like Bobby Leonard are, are one of the reasons the NBA is where it is today. But uh, the last conversation I had with Slick, I would talk to him every couple of weeks. And I know he'd been in the hospital. He had heart surgery about a month and a half ago. And uh, he... Uh, uh, you know, had some uh, heart surgery and then he, he caught COVID. I don't know if you knew that. He caught COVID. And of course he beat that. He's too tough to be. He, you know, I told him I, he'd laugh at COVID. But uh, but anyway, he, he, he'd he been in and out of the hospital. He had some, uh, you know, infections and things like that. And he just got back. So I called him on Sunday and I told him, how you doing? He, he didn't sound very good. He said, oh, I feel like his exact words is I feel like crap. But uh, he said, uh, they're bringing some medicine over tomorrow and I'm, I'm going to get better and all this stuff. And I, I was laughing. I teased, I teased him. I said, well, why don't you just, uh, I'll tell you what, run down to the store and get you a quart of vodka and chug it. And you'll feel a hundred times better. And he started laughing. I mean, I can remember that laugh. He was laughing. He, and his quote was, yeah, I just might do that. <laughs> and then I, you know, I talked to him for a little while and then I hung up and I said, well, I'll give you a holler at the end of the week. And that was on Sunday. And of course, you know, Monday night or Tuesday morning, he passed away. But, uh, you know, I got some great, great memories of him. And I, I really don't think you'll see any of these players. If you talk to any of these players, uh, I don't think a lot of a lot of coaches quite have the uh, repertoire or have the feelings uh, that the players have for him, for them, you know. And uh, <laughs> just, go, uh, just to be, give got everybody a little heads up. This is who we're trying to work on to get on with you, which is oh, Rudy T. Rudy T. And chat yeah, about. He lives in Austin, too. And uh, you guys played against each other in, I think, the San Antonio Spurs first game. Is that correct? Yeah, actually, it was the first game in San Antonio. Uh, we uh, we played the Rockets. and They billed it as the Battle of Texas, whatever that was. And it's like Rudy told you, I think, when you emailed him, uh, I don't remember, you know, like you said, I told him, I told him I talked to you. I said, remember we played, but I don't remember a damn thing about it. That's a little, you know, 50 years ago almost. But I, I laughed. I said, you know, really, I said, you killed us. You gave us 29 points, but we won by two. So I guess, I guess it all worked out. But Rudy was a hell of a player and man, what a coaching career. He had, uh, you know, he had some tough health, health issues, but he beat them all. And he's living here in Austin too. A really nice guy. OK, so now we've got him on alert that we need to get this taken care of. Uh, Bob Nedelecki, Indiana Pacer icon. You know, I feel like uh, I feel like probably uh, 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 Robin did when he was young and you got you told you brought him along and 
he got the career that he got. But I felt, sometimes feel like Robin because you've kind of let me into that ABA family and that Pacer family, and that is truly appreciated from a, 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 a from a kid at heart who uh, loves basketball and loves the ABA. I appreciate you kind of bringing me into you guys' family. I my condolences, of course, on Mel's loss a few years ago, and my condolences on Coach uh, Bobby Slick Leonard's loss. I know he will be missed, and it was a sad day the other day when he passed away. But you guys can go to um, DroppingDimes.org, uh, WeChangeTheGame.com. You can find uh, We Change the Game. Uh, also at hiltonpublishing.com. Neto, I thank you so much, and I think everybody will enjoy, and uh, may Coach Leonard uh, rest in peace. Hey, Billy, great talking to you again, and I look forward to uh, doing something else with you. It's a lot of fun, and we got to get that ball on your – we got to get that ball up there for you. Yes. Oh, I never <laughs> – and it's lanasports.com, correct? It's lanasports.com. Yeah. Lanasports.com. Yes. They, they have a card collection that they have, which proceeds go to uh, the uh, uh, ABA um, um, veterans. And then yeah. also a basketball, which uh, uh, Scott Tarter, I need in the background here. So for all of my video interviews that people will go, where did you get that ball? And I'll be able to tell them. Right. And I'll tell you, the, the link too is on, you know, you go to uh, um, droppingdimes.org and the link to a lot of sports is on there too. They have an article on the ball on that website also. So it's, it's fun. Thank you, Neto. Okay, man. Hey, have a great time.